it's fantastic to be here. This is a really important uh, uh, event in my life, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because this week, the three days, tonight, uh, talking to yourselves, getting feedback, getting uh, ideas across. Tomorrow uh, at uh, Kloster Neuburg, Michelle and I are running um, a workshop, a very friendly, informal workshop, where we're looking to develop uh, the technology and the ideas that I'm going to talk about. So uh, I think there are some spare places, so if anybody doesn't have anything to do tomorrow. You don't have to be a scientist, you know. Uh, you can be either a scientist or a hacker. Um, and uh, just come along because it'll be very friendly. We'll work in groups and so on. And then on uh, Thursday, uh, we have the um, Open Knowledge Foundation uh, in uh, Vienna is uh, running a hackathon during the day at the Vienna Hackspace. Uh, and in the evening, we're having some short talks, I think in the same place, isn't it? Just, um, anyway, uh, we will find out. We have some experts in the audience here who, who will tell us and who will be introduced. So um, I will introduce Michelle in, the, in a minute, but um, uh, off we go. Um, I've called this open notebook science, and if you remember nothing else from this evening, remember those three words, open notebook science, because if we can do that, we will change the world. Uh, that is one of the ways in which we can take where we are at the moment and move to somewhere very considerably better. I have a large message, which is that uh, scientific knowledge matters. Uh, but we're very bad at it. Most scientific data is lost, uh, and it matters. It's not just, well, we didn't get it. People are dying because they don't have knowledge. This is not an exaggeration. Uh, there is a huge amount of medical information which never reaches either the patients or the doctors. Uh, and it's important to realize that patients are intelligent people. And last century, we had a divide between the medical profession and patients. In the digital era, um, the digital enlightenment, as I call it, uh, patients have access and should have access to the same information uh, as everybody else. And they can help uh, to uh, help the decisions, uh, both generally and for their own particular circumstances. The problem is, at the moment, most people don't realize what is possible, and some of the people who do realize what is possible are actively stopping us getting here. So I'm going to use some fairly blunt uh, words uh, during this. I'm actually going to sometimes be polarized uh, as to what Michelle, I, and many others believe, and what uh, some of the rest of the world uh, believes. Open can change this. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a very dear friend, Jean-Claude Bradley, who unfortunately died two weeks ago and is the hero of open notebook science. Um, I'm going to talk about some of what we've been doing in the Open Knowledge Foundation with uh, uh, the Panton concepts and the Panton Fellows. And where's Peter? Peter, stand up. Peter is a uh, second round of... Um, uh, Panton Files from the No Institute in Graz. Um, I'm then going to show what we're going to do in terms of new technology and new social ideas under the term content mining. Um, and unfortunately, we are at a critical point in human history where we are either going to succeed massively or we are going to go into darkness for several decades. Uh, those of you who are aware of what's happening in the world will know that there are many people who are trying to develop creative ideas on the internet. They see it as one of the great liberating forces um, of um, the world. Tim Berners-Lee uh, was presented at the London Olympics two years ago, and he said, this is for everyone. Tremendous gesture. On the other hand, we have everything from the NSA uh, to um, Disney to Elsevier who are trying to close down what we're doing because they see the means of monetizing control over our activities. So how many people here are not in academia or not in the business of academia like FWF? 
Talking it, about them systematically. In a company or? Uh, 10.5. Right, excellent, well done. So I'm talking to you. It is people outside academia I want to reach here because 99% of the world is not in academia and 99% of the world uh, is missing out. This is OpenStreetMap. For those who don't know, OpenStreetMap is a map of the world built by yourselves. And if you look at this, uh, you'll recognize this is where we are. We're actually there. I, d I thought this was number one. But you can see here number three, number five. Every house number in Vienna uh, is on this map. And that's been built by people cycling around the streets mainly or walking. Uh, it's not been copied from any other map. And this was started by one person, Steve Coast, uh, in the UK about 10 years ago, and I remember him talking, uh, his initial uh, lecture, he had some GPS traces from bicycle couriers in London, because that's the quickest way of getting around London on a bicycle. You have to ride over the top of the cars. Um, and um, when you put them together, at the end of the day, you have a map. And this idea caught on, and so... People over the world started mapping, and what you can see on the right-hand side is those are the events in Austria, Vienna, Innsbruck, somewhere I don't quite understand, uh, it says Karlsruhe, and Graz, uh, and so on, and that's just this month. These are Viennese, uh, sorry, Austrians who are mapping Austria. And that's fantastic. And they're doing it because they want to, because they're creating something of huge beauty and value. This is one of my heroes, Nelly Cruz, the um, uh, digital commissioner for Europe. Sadly, she's retiring. Uh, and I take my inspiration for her. She said, I don't do this job because I have to. I'm 71. I do it because I want to. Well, she's 72 now, and so am I, right? Uh, so um, uh, this is a message that, you know, you don't have to stop when you're retired. You can do things which change the world. Uh, and we are going into a new era of open science. It won't be trivial, but it's possible. And I want to say, throughout this, I have huge admiration for FWF. Uh, I think it has a very difficult mission. It's caught between uh, people who expect it to do, make everything free and academics who wonder why it's interfering with their uh, God-given privilege uh, to do their own thing. Open Notebook Science. This was started 10 years ago by Jean-Claude Bradley, uh, and Jean-Claude had a vision, which I've only just recently picked up, although I've worked with him, and I appreciated with my head what he was doing. It was only last week when I was writing up uh, these notes, it suddenly hit me here that this is the only way we should be doing science. Uh, and Jean-Claude, uh, from Drexel University in the States, uh, had this vision of doing science for everybody uh, immediately. Jean-Claude unfortunately died two weeks ago, and as I say, we're having a meeting for him in Cambridge, and I would like this meeting uh, to promote uh, the concept of open notebook science, and in fact, for those three words, to be his memorial. One of the things that um, happens in the digital world is you find other people who share the same views. And in chemistry, although chemistry is a very conservative subject and nearly all software and information uh, is closed, there were a group of us who discovered ourselves on the internet uh, that we wanted the same thing. We wanted open data, open standards, and open source. Uh, and uh, so I catalyzed uh, this um, organization. Um, we met under the Blue Obelisk in San Diego. Um, I rather like it because it's got a sort of Parisian feel of the 1920s, some sort of uh, revolutionary art movement. Um, we have no rules other than open data, open standards, open source. Uh, we have a budget of $10 a year, which I use for buying blue obelisks. Um, and uh, we meet at dinner occasionally. And I give the blue obelisks out. And here's Jean-Claude uh, getting his blue obelisk uh, from Egon Willighagen, another uh, of our members. And here, 
as I say, we have developed open source in a semi-coordinated manner. It's not top-down control. It's bottom-up, but we keep looking to see what others are doing and making sure that we don't duplicate effort, uh, that we interoperate. Uh, very much the same sort of way as people do in Apache or uh, GNU or any of the other open source projects. Now I come on to how research is done and how I think it should be done. This is a traditional model of research. So what you do is you slave away in the lab, you try and get some experiments to work, uh, they start working three and a half years into your thesis um, uh, and so on, uh, and then you rapidly then uh, take what you've got, write them up, uh, and, uh, and so forth. This is a very painful process because when you get to writing your thesis up you have lost the data that you collected in year one because you didn't think it was going to be important or your mind said I've got all that stuff and you suddenly just go I don't have the spectrum of this thing and it's decomposed or you know uh, this mouse was want to do what, well and I haven't got the mouse you know and I need to take a photograph of it or whatever so uh, and so you backtrack you Sometimes you get sent back to do more experiments because you've lost the experiments that you know you did in the first year. Even when you come to write your thesis up, you keep writing and writing and your supervisor looks and says, oh, put some more stuff in here and so forth. So it goes round and round. And then finally, you publish it. Now, if you're writing a paper, it's much the same. You do all your work and so on. You get little isolated bits of data. And when you come to submit it, uh, the editors say, oh, we want some more of that. We don't believe this experiment. Do some more work. Do some more work. Do some more work. Or send it to another journal. So keep going round and round this uh, cycle. Finally, you publish it. Traditionally, of course, you publish in a printed journal. My first paper was in 1966. Uh, I was very proud of it, uh, and it went in a new journal of the Journal of the Chemical Society called Chemical Communications, um, and um, that was absolutely fine at that time. The uh, Chemical Society, now the Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, was a fine, upstanding, learned society at that stage. Uh, you didn't think too much about the journals. Um, they made most of their money from memberships and other things like that. Uh, and um, libraries bought this journal and archived it. It worked very well then, 50 years ago. Now, we're in the digital age, but we still have this model, but unfortunately, this model can be monetized very easily. And what we now found is that the output of your scientific research belongs to the publisher. And Michelle is going to tell you more about that in a minute. I'm not overestimating the problems we have here. Uh, and Michelle, uh, this is a good introduction to Michelle. Michelle uh, is here on her own right. Uh, she's giving a plenary lecture in Edinburgh uh, next week, next month. End of this month on uh, open data and so on. So uh, she's equal in this area. And here is a question she asked to the uh, Vice Chancellor of Cambridge. And I'm going to hand over to her now. Uh, and the next slide after this will be yours, right? Okay. Um, so here's the, Vice, here's the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge being asked, uh, are we paying too much to Elsevier? And he's saying, yes, and the message at the bottom Elsevier is already looking at ways in which it control open data. So just to put this into some kind of context, this question was asked on the back of a bit of work that I'd been doing alongside Tim Gowers in the UK. Uh, Elsevier are one of the biggest journals, the uh, biggest publishers. They have a large number of journals within the sciences. And they're traditionally as well very, very expensive. Not only are they expensive, but they make it impossible for libraries to release the information about how much it costs for the libraries to buy their journals. They have non-disclosure clauses in the contracts. They require libraries to pay. So libraries can't even discuss amongst themselves formally how much each library is paying. So Tim is a mathematician at Cambridge. He's a fellow at Trinity, and he has an ongoing disagreement with Elsevier. And he wanted to really try and challenge the status quo and really try and push back and try and get this data out there. 
So through a number of FOIs and through him talking to a number of people um, at kind of JISC and places like that, and as well as providing a bit of support myself, uh, we managed to get all of the Russell Group University libraries to release the subscription data for Elsevier journals. And it showed a huge disparity in the amounts that were being charged from Cambridge paying about 1.2 million through to the University of Exeter, I think, paid about 200,000 pounds for access to largely and broadly the same material, which is ridiculous. You can kind of see why they didn't want us actually to see that data. But what's really great here now, actually, is that having uh, ha encouraged the Russell Group universities to release this data, over the next month, we're going to actually be going and approaching every other university in the UK to see if we can get them to release their data as well. And then also try and encourage every library to release the data from other publishers. Because although this, this data is not locked under non-disclosure clauses, it is still not normally discussed. It is still not normally made open. So we think this will be interesting and will allow the libraries to push back a little bit more when it comes to the next round of uh, negotiations, when libraries are trying to work out how much they're going to pay each publisher for access to their journals. We're also really hoping that having this data out there is a message that we can take to academics, to people in this room and to others, to show them how much the cost of publishing really is. For that's what it is. Uh, libraries paying journal subscriptions, that's just another form of, of publishing. That's, that's just another publishing cost. There's a lot of criticism, complaint from certain areas of academia where that people are unhappy about uh, article processing charges, the amount of money that many academics will pay to have an article published in an open access journal. But all this is doing actually is kind of making more apparent to academics the cost of this broader publishing system. It's, it's very difficult at the moment. Traditionally, they've, they've been, the academics have been very much separated and protected from these costs because it's been the libraries who've been, uh, been paying for it. And we're hoping by being able to take this message about journal subscription costs to academics, more than a couple will get a little bit upset and start talking to their libraries about how they can help try and change the system as well. So one of the projects I've been working on has been that subscription piece with Tim. A second piece I've been working on has been around exploring uh, article processing charges. So this came off the back of the Wellcome Trust releasing, Wellcome Trust major research charity in the UK, released all of their article processing charge data for the last year, it made it CC0 and actively encouraged people to go out and explore it. It was very messy, it was very unclean with lots of journal names being incorrect and lots of missing DOIs or unfound DOIs and authors occasionally a bit muddled up. But the one thing that we did know was how much the Wellcome Trust had paid for each piece of, for each article. So we, they were actively encouraging us to go away and explore this stuff. So we did. We crowdsourced a bit of an effort and about, it was somewhere between 60, pe 60 and 70 people got involved from the Open Knowledge Foundation's Open Access Working Group to start tidying up this data set, to start making it make sense a little bit, but then adding additional data. So when the original data set was released, it was very limited. And we decided we wanted to add a little bit more to it so that we could understand what was taking place. One of the key things that we started separate or started identifying was who were the publishers in each case and whether or not the journal in question was a pure open access journal or whether it was what is called a hybrid open access journal. So pure open access journals run purely on the either on income generated through the act of publishing. So that may be um, through advertising or it may be through article processing charges, as previously mentioned. The hybrid journal, however, is an interesting beast. It's not only can you pay 
article processing charges, APCs, I'll refer to them from now on, and publishing them in an open access fashion. But the journals also receive a bunch of money from the libraries. Libraries still have to subscribe to a lot of the, to, to many of these journals, because most of the articles within them are not open access themselves. So you actually have two funding streams going into the same journal, to the same publisher, for the same pieces of work, which doesn't really make sense. So we started identifying and pulling out these bits and pieces, and it got really quite interesting, and I'll discuss some of those results later. However, on the back of that, FWF released their data set, and we started exploring that as well, and I'll run through that in a little bit. But what I really ought to just mention is what I consider open access actually to be. So just to say, when I talk about open access, the important things here, the licensing, CC BY or equivalent. A lot of people, you know, there's a lot of conversation and discussion, but no, that's the important thing. Second point, no embargo. There's a lot of, again, a lot of people start getting arsy and upset about that. No embargo. I think that's really important when we discuss open access. Thirdly, cost effective for research funders and for academics. And fourthly, actually easy to find and use. So not just kind of locked away in the dark cupboard somewhere, but actually out there for others to actually get involved with. What I really dislike more than anything is what I term bad open access. I don't go down a gold versus green argument. That's open access done through journals or open access done through repositories, respectively. Instead, good and bad. Bad open access looks like this. Within repositories, it's long embargo periods, it's non-CC by licenses, and it's the idea of lots of small repositories individually lying around, not joined together in any sensible fashion. With journals, again, it comes down to non-CC by licenses, high article processing charges, high APCs, and hybrid journals. I think I began to give some idea of why I dislike APCs earlier. So, as I mentioned, FWF released a data set. And I, we did a little bit of rough analysis. I just want to kind of show it to some of you now, because I don't think everyone in this room has necessarily seen it. So the data set they released was, it was about 1,300, 1,400 line items, which covered about 1,100 articles with a number of kind of other costs. This tends to cover page charges or color charges, which many journals actually require you to pay, even if it's only going to be online, because color pixels obviously cost far more than black <laughs> pixels. The overall amount was about 2.6, 2.7 million euros from 89 different publishers, and it covered basically the last year of the amounts that they'd been charged. So, we did a little bit, I did a little bit of analysis and started kind of identifying what proportion of this was gold open, pure gold open access or hybrid open access. And so kind of if you look at the two figures there at the top on the right, so there's some cost. And you'll notice that gold open access, these 202 gold open access articles, came to 285,000 pounds. Hybrid open access came to just over 2 million. 2 million euros was spent on publishing articles in journals to which your libraries are already paying subscription fees. Just a little bit, it's, it's an interesting thing there, I think. It was roughly the same when I looked at the Wellcome Trust data set as well, which means that it's not just in one country and it's not just single discipline specific, but instead this is a very broad problem that we're facing. Another interesting point was to look at the average there, the one, two, three, four, fifth column over. It's interesting to note that gold open access, the average cost, is about 1.5, 1,500 1, euros, whereas the hybrid open access journals come to about 2.2 thousand. So it's costing more to publish in journals, which are receiving a second income stream. Again, that doesn't make sense. It's not quite, you know, it's an interesting thing to be in. So just quickly, who's benefiting from this two million pounds? It's the usual suspects. So when you look at which journals it is, it's, you've got kind of the publishers there, the big five publishers for the 
it was actually both in terms of the number of articles published, but also in terms of the total cost. Elsevier, just over a million euros, not a huge surprise. They were a huge chunk of the journals for the Wellcome Trust as well. But then Wiley Blackwell, American Chemical Society was perhaps slightly more unexpected from my side, at least for me, Springer and then PLOS. Public Library of Science being an open access journal publisher and, and following up there in the rear. So what I then started to do was started to identify hybrid and gold for each of these top five publishers. And it starts being quite an interesting uh, kind of image there. So in the, on the end column, I've pulled together the percentage spent on hybrid journals. So it's the percentage of those, the percentage of the sum that is being spent publishing in hybrid journals. And if you run down that figure, it's 93% of the money given to Elsevier was used to publish in a hybrid journal. It's nearly a million pounds, uh, nearly a million euros. Sorry, different country. But the same is true for each of the others, other than PLOS, which is sat there on its own at a kind of 0% and everything, because that's a gold open access publisher. And the final slide I just want to say before I wrap up, why is this? I mean, these are kind of some of the questions. It's, it's all well and good to look at the data, but that's not, and, you know, that's not going to change anything. You actually need to start thinking about why this is. Is it a problem? Personally, I think yes, it is, because I don't think journals should have multiple funding streams for the same piece of work. I wouldn't charge my time out to two different organisations. I don't quite see why journals necessarily feel they can do. And then the final one, if you think that it is a problem, what can be done about it? In my opinion, one major thing is to tell other academics about this, talk to others and show that it's a problem. Secondly, talk to libraries, tell them that you think it's a problem because they're the ones who've got some power to kind of push back a little bit. Thirdly, encourage other academics and do it yourself to go and, and complain to publishers and point out that these ridiculous APCs aren't quite on. And I'm sure there are a whole number of other options that funders or institutions have at their disposal to try and kind of solve this a little bit. But anyway, I'm going to sit down now because Peter will get angsty and kind of nobble no, me. No, no, no. Sure. But yes, if anyone wants to talk about this afterwards, please do come and find me. It's something that I do enjoy talking about. <laughs> So Michelle has done an incredible job uh, pulling this together and I would have said that this effort by itself has probably gone a long way towards saving considerable amounts of money. Firstly, I, mean, I discovered from this data set six papers that Elsevier had put behind a paywall, um, 15,000 euros for six papers, something like that, and they said uh, they'd pay this back. Um, we will find out uh, whether they do or not. We have a serious problem. Uh, we are facing an industry which wishes to take control of everything we do. And I can't overstress this. And we'll come to one or two instances later. So, where's it got right? How many of you develop uh, free or open software? Good. Um, so, free and open software uh, has been around for um, perhaps... 30 years, something like that, uh, and um, it's now a, a very well-engineered and very effective system. How many people use GitHub, for example? Exactly. GitHub, for those who haven't come across it, is a repository of software quite different from a repository for journals and so on, because it is a working repository, it uh, does things of value to uh, somebody, and that's why people use it. So um, let's assume that this is me here. I'm not developing code in a vacuum. By the way, I develop code every day, um, and if I had time, I would click on this, and this would show today's repository. Uh, and I develop code every few minutes. I test it. Uh, so the repository provides a testing system. And that's one of the things we need to do for academia. We need to have a testing system uh, for journals uh, and papers and, uh, uh, and so on. So I test it. I validate it. Um, 
I make it available to people, but I also build on what other people have done here. So it's a, <coughs> a, a, an interconnected system. If people like a piece of code, they can fork it. Uh, so you get multiple versions, but the uh, engineering is so good that these multiple versions can all be reconciled any time you want. Um, uh, and it's a marvelous system of reconciling um, uh, all of this code. It's used because it's valuable, not because people feel they have to put it there, but because they want to put it there. So if we can get a system where scientists want to put their data into a repository because it benefits them, uh, then we have solved all of these problems you've heard about. All of these problems about access, charges, and so on, they all disappear uh, in what I'm going to show you. And it's not a pipe dream. Uh, so. Jean-Claude Bradley came up with this concept of open notebook science. That is, that as you do science, you record it. There is none of this business of doing something in the lab and three months later, three years later, writing it up. You write it up the minute you do it. And that's got so many uh, values. It means that you can't make so many mistakes. It means you can validate it. It means that other people uh, can uh, help you with it. Uh, it takes away all possibility of fraud, for example. Um, and uh, he came up with this idea of open notebook science. We knocked the terms around a bit, as you can see. Um, and I'm really glad that he did come up with this because it's a precise term and it's not confused with so many of the other things that open science uh, could mean. Here, for example, I'm not going to read all of this, but you can see at the bottom, failed experiments are almost never included in publications. But they are in open notebook science because you record everything. And it's no extra labor to record uh, a failed experiment. In software, we record failed experiments all the time. I don't use the word fail. These are just experiments. And some experiments turn out to be more useful than others. But even the ones which, quotes, fail are valuable because they help you decide better what to do in the future. A phrase that Jean-Claude came up with is no insider information. It's got to be all out there. Now, when you develop source code on GitHub, the whole world can see everything you do. They can see uh, what's in this 200, uh, uh, you know, 200 line routine. They can go in. If they don't think it's working correct, they can um, uh, find out what would be better, and they mail you. It's called posting an issue. Um, and uh, they can make changes and so on. We need that in science where the world is watching uh, to see what you do. Now, you're already thinking, well, how can we possibly do that and so on? Well, I'll show you. It can and is being done. So here's some more from Jean-Claude. Uh, here is a typical uh, chemical um, synthesis. Here you can see he's recorded... Um, uh, the procedure, uh, this is a thin layer chroma chromatogram uh, which proves what you've got. These spots tell you whether you've got the right stuff or not. You can't fake it. What we get now in many journals, as I'm sure you know, is people, when they come to write it up, well, it didn't actually work out or it didn't look very good, and they Photoshop it, right? It's called Photoshopping gels. This is a TLC, but it's similar to a, a gel. And journals have to spend their time building software uh, to try and work out whether it's been fudged. Here's Jean-Claude's log. You can see down the bottom here, you can if I can find my pointer, uh, that it's recorded to the minute. Those are the precise times at which it's done. And even that might matter. It might uh, matter uh, what time of day it was done because of the ambient temperature. Who knows? But a complete record of the experiment. And the spectra are included as well. So this is the diagram I take from open source software, free and open source software, um, to uh, open notebook science. Science is more complicated than software because there are more things you can do in science. So uh, not only do you have data and computation, I've called it model here, but you've got instruments, data, uh, you've got code. All of this goes into modern science. 
But all of these, in principle, can be captured and monitored. So we're moving into an era where your uh, central heating will be monitored by a machine and uh, you've come across this idea of the Internet of Things. Your house will be on the Internet. The only thing that won't be on the internet, and it's a crime, is your million euro uh, NMR spectrometer, which is still printing stuff out on paper. I mean, in Cambridge, if people have uh, a spectrum, they don't get it in electronic form. It gets printed out and they photocopy. Uh, it's okay, it's okay, you won't die, you won't die. It's true, isn't it? Well, it certainly is in Cambridge. Um, and we tried, we got funding from JISC to change this, and we couldn't. We actually tried to get the chemists to put their spectra into our repository, and it didn't work because we've used the wrong verbs. It's not putting your spectrum into a repository. That's wrong. It is building a system in which they want to do a 21st century experiment. That's what we've got to aim at. Um, and so on. So, can it happen? Is this a pipe dream? And the answer is no. This is Matt Todd at the University of Sydney. Uh, he's a senior lecturer or reader in chemistry, assistant professor, I think, in chemistry. And Matt is a brilliant person. Do get him to come and talk here. You don't need to know any chemistry to understand. And it will be, he talked to the Open Knowledge Foundation two years ago, and it was spellbinding. Matt wants to use his chemistry not to advance his career, but actually to stop people getting malaria. And let's remember, that is one of the major roles that you are funding research here, is actually to make the world a better place. Uh, and um, it's not easy to cure malaria. The parasites mutate. Um, all sorts of things happen. Uh, and it's hard grind. And what Matt has done here is traditional medicinal chemistry, make this stuff, record it. Just, Matt started about the same time as Jean-Claude. Uh, record everything in the open. And here's some medicinal chemistry. This shows how boring it is. I spent 15 years in Glaxo, and it is boring. Most of the time, nothing works out. Uh, but here, you've got, you make a change from this nitrogen here, to the oxygen above, and the thing gets 300 times better. That's, but you don't know it's going to happen. You've got to do it, and then you've got to try and um, recall it. Now, in the pharmaceutical industry, what's happening is every company is doing this. They all think that they've got a, new, uh, a, a unique vision on the world, and they haven't. When I came out of Glaxo, I discovered that all the companies were doing very much the same stuff. They're all making the same sort of compounds, huge amount of duplication of waste and so on. Uh, there's one documented example of um, a company which uh, watched another company on COX-2 inhibitors uh, spend $250 million on a project that they knew was going to fail because their project had failed. What a waste of effort when human health uh, is at, at stake. So Matt is changing uh, this uh, ethos. And we had a wonderful meeting in um, WHO at the Open Knowledge Foundation last year where uh, Matt had brought together a whole lot of people who were uh, also adhering to this idea of can we do things in the open to save this waste and to accelerate things. Matt himself has worked with the WHO. He's taken a compound called praziquantel, which is an anti-schistosomiasis drug. And when he couldn't find out how to do it, he put out this on the internet and says, can anybody out there help me? Because it was open, people came to help him. If he'd said, well, I'm going to patent the result and then I'm going to make myself rich, people wouldn't have done it. But no, nope, a company who specialized in this said, yeah, we'll, we'll do this. And they, within a week, they'd found exactly the right compound uh, to do the um, resolution with. OK, data. You've seen Michelle's figures. When you come to data, those figures are minute compared with the data. I believe that the world spends 400 billion USD on uh, scientific research. STM. It's very difficult to get these figures because it's not quite clear what science, what's applied, what's in companies and so on. But it's about that. 
Uh, and what does it produce? Well, it produces more than papers. It produces, it builds organizations. It, you know, turns people into better scientists. It makes materials, but it produces data. And most of that data is lost. In the subject of computational chemistry, all the data is lost. There's not a single computational experiment uh, where the data is transmitted for other people to use. And that's probably a billion dollars worth of um, uh, science a year. It's very important. It saves us doing experiments. But you have to repeat it all again because not even the coordinates of, uh, uh, of the material uh, is left. Now, we spend 400 billion. What's the value of that? It must be more than 400 uh, billion because we're wasting our money otherwise, right? No point in spending 400 billion and getting 400 billion back. It's got to be more than that. So, have we got a measurement? Well, we've got a measurement with the human genome. Uh, the US taxpayers uh, spent $4 billion on the human genome, and Battelle uh, company, CRO, measured that, and they said that the downstream value was $800 billion and 4 million job years. So a multiplier of nearly 200. Now, that's slightly fallacious because it wasn't just the human genome that gave rise to all this uh, technology. But it's a very good story. If you want to convince your politicians that money in science is worth it, take this because it's unassailable. You know, it's, it's a commission, this is commissioned by the US government, right? Uh, and so I use a figure not of 200, but about three or four, something like that, because it sounds a little more reasonable. But it has clearly got to be in that area. So our 400 billion that we spend has got to be worth 1.2 trillion or something like that, or it's not worth doing. Here's some more. The Lancet, uh, five years ago, said that 85% of the work done was wasted because it wasn't, pub uh, it wasn't uh, done properly, it wasn't published properly, it wasn't reported properly. Wasted, right, $100 billion. So, you know, I'm not making these figures up. And last week in PLOS uh, uh, Medicine, confirmation here, poor access, poor dissemination, and poor uptake. Waste. That waste means people die. It's as simple as that. Okay, just to verify the sums, $400 billion, about a million and a half articles. Nobody knows how many because the only uh, publications are by closed access publishers who say, well, we can't let you know which papers have been published unless you pay us and then promise not to tell anybody. So one of the things we're hoping to do is to liberate this information by doing it ourselves. If you divide that, that means that every, uh, you need $300,000 uh, to create one publication. That's the way the sum works out, right? Uh, and Michelle has just shown you that it needs somewhere round about I don't know, between two and $10,000 to publish a paper because much of that was in subscription costs, which, of course, we're not allowed to know uh, because we're forbidden to do it or we go to jail. Uh, so the sums just about work out. 2% of research uh, is spent on publication and should be spent on publication, and that's a figure that the Wellcome Trust comes up with and which you yourselves come up with that you... You know, it is a necessary and valuable part of the research process uh, to publish it. We're in the era of the um, digital enlightenment. That is the Austrian enlightenment at the end of the 18th century. The whole of Europe went through an enlightenment there, and one can see it in the buildings, in the writings, in the culture. And we are now in the digital enlightenment. You've seen OpenStreetMap, part of the digital enlightenment. Wikipedia, part of the digital enlightenment. The World Wide Web, it's a huge flourishing of human creativity and uh, knowledge. But in science, we are still using 19th century methods to communicate. Michael Nielsen has said uh, very convincingly uh, in his book, Reinventing Discovery, and if you haven't read it, you should. Uh, it's a very clear idea of the new ways of, of doing discovery, not just in science. He's also in maths and, and so forth. Um, but 
We do it by collaboration, networking, not by top-down, uh, cellular, uh, isolated, non-competing um, areas of science. And the outstanding example of this is uh, the Polymath project. Now, Michelle has already referred to Tim Gowers because Tim has spent the last uh, three months of his life uh, trying to show how uh, unacceptable Elsevier's charges are, but Tim is also a Fields Medalist, which is the equivalent of Nobel Prize in mathematics. He's a wonderful person. Um, and uh, about five years ago, four years ago, he said, why am I doing all this uh, uh, maths by myself? Why don't I get people to help? So he came up with a hard problem in maths and said, Let's see if the world can solve this problem. He writes a blog, uh, and um, uh, anybody could join in. Anybody in this room. Uh, any, anyone at school could join in, and so on. Because it's not necessarily you know, established mathematicians who've got the only way uh, of solving things. And within, I think, seven weeks, they had not only solved this problem, but they'd solved a harder problem. This is polymath 9. I'm sure some of you know this problem, P and NP. It's a, a question in the um, complexity of algorithms. The discussion is on his blog, and that is the world tackling this problem. I don't think they've solved it yet, but you can read along in it. And even if you don't know any maths, you can get a feeling for how people actually are doing collaborative maths. And it, it's stunning. So. We now come on to this idea of open, and we are very fortunate that people have been here ahead of us. Open is a difficult word uh, because, first of all, it's a very common one in the English language, and secondly, it's been seriously misused by lots of people. We really need a technical term for it, and actually we have technical terms. We have CC BY, we have... Um, uh, OSI compliant, that's OSI as in um, uh, open uh, source um, uh, initiative. Uh, we have a number of things which say this is exactly that. But we persist in using these uh, misused and overloaded words. And unfortunately, the uh, people who want to make money out of constraining us use these terms to confuse us. So you will get a publisher who says, this is fully open, right, fully open access. You're not allowed to print it, you're not allowed to download it, you're not allowed to disseminate it, you're not allowed to do that, but it's fully open access, right, until December, right. And you see this sort of rubbish, um, don't you, Michelle? Yes. <laughs> um, the... Richard Stallman, who is one of my heroes, uh, has come up with this phrase that it is a matter of liberty. That's the important thing. The words, if you really want to think about uh, open, think about liberty, justice, equality. Words that came out of the original enlightenment. That's what open means. Uh, empowerment. And uh, in the Open Knowledge Foundation, we've come up with free to use redistribute, sorry, reuse, reuse, and redistribute. In other words, so long as you acknowledge the person who did it, you can do whatever you like with it. So this is uh, Richard again. I think I'll skip over that. It's saying the same sort of uh, thing as I've just said. I want to pay tribute to the people who've made this open. Richard, uh, Linus Torvalds, Tim Berners-Lee, and the Human Genome Project, because all of those could have said, oh, we're going to make a lot of money out of this. We're going to patent it. Craig Vento was going to patent the human genome. Uh, there have been many people who tried to patent software uh, and so forth. And uh, it is fantastic that these people have said, no, we're doing this for the benefit of humanity. And while I'm doing it, I want to remember Aaron Schwartz. Uh, for those who don't know, Aaron was a teenage genius. Uh, he developed RSS when he was 12. Uh, he did this in MIT. His parents had to go and uh, uh, babysit him while he was in MIT talking with uh, Richard Stallman. He passionately believed that uh, this should be open. Uh, two years ago, he, downloaded, he was in MIT. He downloaded uh, journal articles to which he had a right to read. He downloaded these. Uh, the federal government caught him at it. 
They said it is a federal crime and we are going to sentence you to 35 years in jail for downloading journal articles. That's the world we're in. He committed suicide. So, here is the human genome uh, um, um, manifesto, the Bermuda Principles, and uh, again, the same sort of thing as open notebook science. Within 24 hours, everything you do has to be available to the whole world. No sneaky business with some people getting there first or whatever. Everybody has to have access to this. And this is the Budapest Open uh, Access Initiative. And I want to go through this in a little bit of detail because it's a marvellous document. Um, it's a document which I think stands and probably was derived from documents such as uh, the Declaration of Independence and so on because it talks about why this is so important in the human context. So the internet has brought an unprecedented public good that is what I mean by the Enlightenment. Completely free and unrestricted access to everybody. And what I particularly like here is not just students, but also other curious minds. And I have a project uh, which uh, uh, came up in discussion at the Shuttleworth meeting last week. We have uh, two of the children of uh, one of the people there who are three and five years old want to do a project on dinosaur names. That's what we're aiming at. They love the binomial names of dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus rex, you know, they love that. And uh, they will correct their mother when she gets these things wrong. Those are the scientists of the future. And we're going to build a system where we're going to give them all the dinosaur names uh, as they come out. And I'm going to tell you how. Just to say that we are moving into the era of data-intensive scientific discovery where half the discoveries will be made without a physical laboratory. And the great thing about this is that any citizen in the world can participate in this as long as they have access. And you may have heard of uh, Galaxy Zoo where a million stars were made available to the world because they didn't have the resources to process them. It would have taken 50 PhD years and within a year they'd catalogued the whole of this for people who'd never heard the word astrophysicist before but are now the authors of 20 peer-reviewed scientific publications. So citizens can be scientists and want to be scientists if we allow them. And that's the point of this year. So, data. Huge value, very problematic. So, there are data banks. It's difficult to set up a data bank. Uh, and even when you do, people don't use it. So, my colleague, Ross Mounts, who you'll meet in the slides in a minute, uh, is working in phylogenetics. Phylogenetics is a long word for evolutionary trees, right? Okay. Uh, and um, so... Uh, there's a, a, a data bank for that. People don't put the data in because we've got the wrong model. Put in repository, wrong model. Traditionally, we've had, Christoph has mentioned the crystallographic database, and this was a marvelous creation in the 1970s uh, and the 1980s uh, when I was working on the collection of all crystallographic knowledge. But now, crystallographic knowledge is published onto the web directly, with the result that the crystallographic database has run out of its raison d'etre. And here you can see restrictions. This is public data. This is done by scientists who are required by the publication to put it into the Cambridge database. And Cambridge says, the data should be treated as confidential. This is published scientific data, and you cannot get them out of this database unless you treat them as confidential. And worse, the software, software developed from the data. So if you get this data and write a program to do something clever, you are not allowed to distribute this program without the permission of the Cambridge database. And this is, quite frankly, uh, unacceptable. Now, I... Uh, have tried to get data out of Cambridge using free freedom of information. I was refused. I am not giving up. If they're watching this program, uh, I'm still coming. Uh, but there's a way around, and this is a 
wonderful effort uh, set up with virtually no funding by Armand Lebel uh, in um, France, first of all, and then by uh, Zaulius Gretzoulis in Vilnius, uh, where I had the privilege to visit earlier this year. And this is a database which is built purely voluntarily. So this is, if you like, the open street map equivalent for crystallography. And we did something of the same. Now, because our ethos is not to compete, you know, if we'd been traditional scientists, we'd say, oh, these buggers in Lithuania, we, may, we can't let them do it. We're going to hide this from them. We're going to beat them and so on. No, the ethos is let's join. So we have donated all our stuff to them. And that means that our software lives on uh, and, you know, our ideas are a communal part here. And that is the way that communal science uh, should be done. Unfortunately, we're seeing the other side of things. So um, how many of you have come across Mendeley? Right. How many of you used Mendeley? How many of you still use Mendeley? Well, first of all, I'm very pleased to hear that. Mendeley <laughs> is a great idea. Uh, it says, let's have a site where people can do their, um, the management of their bibliography, uh, their citations. When you write a paper, you have to put in all these references, you know, maybe 50 or even more of people who've done other work, and you have to cite it, okay? And it's tedious to find all this, and you really want to say, well, I've got all these papers, and I've got them on my machine. Oh, no, that was the machine I dropped on the floor last week. I, I did drop my machine before Christmas, right, which is why I've moved from Windows to uh, a Mac Unix system, right? Um, uh, but you lose them. Everybody loses data, so you lose your references. So Mendeley is one way you put it on the web uh, and so on, and it's great. You can, you know, find references, share references, uh, and so on, except it was bought by, by Elsevier. Now... So this is not just me, but here's uh, David Dobbs, who's a well-known writer in the um, uh, computer area. The motive is to acquire the user data. In other words, it's now got uh, many hundreds of thousands of user data on that. It knows all about them. And it also wants to destroy. And this is a model uh, which in the Microsoft era was embrace, extend, exterminate, right? Or extinguish. And this is the problem that's happening in this area. Every time there's an innovation, uh, people say, why are all the innovations being bought either by Elsevier or by Macmillan Digital Science? Macmillan is the company that publishes Nature. All the innovations are being bought up and they will be controlled. They'll either be sidelined or they will be used for control. So, Let's say that you're a vice chancellor, president of a university. You want to know uh, what your uh, scientists in your university are doing. You want to know which fields to invest in. Uh, you want to know whether they're working hard enough, all these things. You go to Elsevier and you say, give me the bibliographic uh, effort of all these people. Who's actually working? What are they reading? What are the fields that they're interested in? How many of you trust Facebook? How many of you trust Google? How many of you trust Elsevier? <laughs> Elsevier is in the same category. They are a huge multinational run by business people whose motivation is to maximize profit. Nothing wrong in the capitalist world except that they are maximizing profit out of controlling us. So I am extremely concerned about the control. And very few people actually realize the danger here, but uh, we're going to see it in data. If you have, we've got $400 billion of data that we have to manage. We don't have the system. So let's say Macmillan comes along and says to a university, you know, we can uh, sell you a wonderful system to manage your data. That system can actually have a window onto everything you're doing. And worse, do you trust everything that you read on Google as being the exact priority of things? No. It's whatever Google serves up to you, and that's a totally secret algorithm, and I have no idea what the algorithm is, but you can bet it's in Google's interest to serve up whatever they serve to you. So it will be in Macmillan's interest to serve up whatever they serve to a vice chancellor. 
and it may not necessarily be objective fact. They know I say this, um, uh, and so on. So, we felt we had to um, uh, challenge this. And in uh, 2010, we came up with the Pantom principles for open data. And the point of this was to say, let's, let us not fall into the same problems with data as we did with open access. Let's try and get out the idea that data is by right open. Uh, and uh, let's avoid all the mess that we've had with green and gold, which is appalling nomenclature. And I believe green and gold as terms have cost us uh, probably tens of billions already and are continuing to do so. Let's say exactly what it is. And so four of us um, met at the Panton Arms in uh, Cambridge. And uh, uh, here we are. And um, a number of other people. Uh, that's the Panton Arms, a lovely pub. Uh, and um, we came up with these principles, which are very simple. Publish your data openly and license it either with CC0 or PDDL. That's it. Um, the, the principles as we wrote them are too complicated, aren't they, Michelle? Yes. They don't fit on the T-shirt. And so yeah. Miche Michelle is going to uh, redesign, I, I mean, not just Michelle, the community under you know, Michelle's... Uh, We're going to lead a, a bit of a rewrite on them um, so that we've got something that's a little bit more readable, a little bit more understandable by a wider audience. I, I'm all about kind of open in terms of participation as well, so kind of making it so others can actually understand and see it. Um, but that's kind of a task for, for this summer, I hope. Yeah. And we can also change it from just being science to research more broadly, because I'm really keen to try and make those kind of ideas of open research data being much more inclusive. So anyway, uh, Jonathan Gray from the OK have came up with this brilliant idea that um, uh, we should get fellowships uh, under the Panton idea. And so we've done this. We've had funding from um, Slo uh, not Sloan, um, OSF, Open Society uh, uh, Foundation, uh, and more recently the CCIA. Our first two fellows here uh, were Sophie Kershaw, the stilettoed mathematician. Uh, she only wears red stiletto heels. She's a wonderful person, as you will see in a minute. And Ross Mance, who uh, is a paleontological phylogeneticist. Uh, and this year, we have three fellows, uh, Rosie Graves in Leicester, uh, Sam Cook in... Sam... Is Cook? Sam Moore. Moore. Sam Moore in London. I, you know, I know them well, I just forget names. And uh, here, uh, Peter. Stand up, Peter. So... <laughs> and now I'm going to show you what the first two Panton fellows did. And the message here is absolutely critical. Young people know what the future should be, or if they don't, they will go out uh, and do their best. And you should get young people on board. I listened to a talk last week by someone from the Office of National Statistics in the UK and said, you should get 13-year-olds on board because their brains have not become hardened. And this is absolutely serious, that you should be getting 13-year-olds. Uh, and Nelly Crow said this as well. She slept in bar camps in, um, uh, in Spain and said, the 14-year-olds there were just fantastic. You should have your young people uh, in that. Um, so, uh, very briefly, Sophie has come up with the way that graduate students should be trained. Graduate students should not be trained by lecturers. They should be trained by third-year graduate students who've been through the pain and know what losing data is about, and they will listen to third-year uh, students. They won't listen to me, right? But they will So here's Sophie, you can see in the background, and she's talking about reproducible and openness in science. And here she is again, a um, bit more animated. Uh, but you can see here, uh, she's come up with version control. Software people know all about version control. That's what uh, Git and uh, Bitbucket and so on are about. But here you can see in the middle of this, push, push. And that is the model for committing your results to a repository, not because you have to, but because you want to. 
And this is her very uh, uh, groundbreaking experiment. She wanted to see how reproducible science was, okay? So she's got two groups here. Uh, one of them did computation on cancer and one on uh, infectious diseases. Uh, and they uh, built a computational experiment. So they did real computational biology work for 10 days. And then after 10 days, what they did is uh, they weren't allowed to talk to each other at all, right? Pain of something terrible. Um, and uh, after 10 days, what they did is they wrote down what they'd done and all the instructions on how to do it, and they handed it over to the others, and they still weren't allowed to talk to them. Uh, and then they want to see whether their instructions were actually good enough for the next lot uh, to uh, compute. And that, uh, I'm sure you will understand, is a really good way of getting all the points on board. When you've been through that, if your peers, the people in your year, say, you didn't write that up properly, you know, you made a misprint, you forgot to put in this or what, um, uh, and so on, uh, then you take it on board. And here she is, and you can see 90% uh, said uh, that they had taken this message on board. Ross um, is uh, working to liberate data. I'm going to tell you about our project. We plan with Michelle and Ross and Jenny Malloy, who was in the picture uh, earlier, to liberate 100 million facts a year from the scientific literature. And Ross has started this. Uh, these are evolutionary trees, and our plan is to have software, which is very well advanced, which can actually interpret those diagrams as diagrams, read the pixels, and come up with evolutionary trees from them. I don't have time to show you what he's done, but he's collected about uh, 10,000 uh, evolutionary trees from the literature. Each of these probably costs $10,000 to compute. They're not cheap. So we're talking about $100 million of computation, which is all rendered as pixels on paper. And if people want those trees, they measure it with a ruler in this century. OK, so we come back to this open notebook science. We've got some challenges, uh, but you see we've added here CC BY, and we've added that the world is part of this process. And the challenge is to come up with an open engineered repository. It's harder than uh, GitHub and um, Stack Overflow and Bitbucket and so on because there's much more in it. But given the will, it's certainly possible. And there are people doing it. The uh, University of Southampton is building this for instruments. Um, uh, we and Henry Zepper in Imperial are building it for computational chemistry. Uh, we've talked about computational biology. So there are bits happening all over, but very little funding for it. A lot of it is done just because of people's passion to build it. But when it happens, uh, it will change the way we access this information. That is our model, open notebook science. Let me, sorry, let me just go back. If we can get to that, then all our problems are solved. Scientists, as they do it, uh, the material is not only archived necessarily, but it's also validated. You can't have fraud in the system. You cannot have invalid data because anybody in the world uh, can validate it and so forth. So until then, what can we do? This is our broken model, uh, where the output belongs to the publisher. What can we do? And I know I'm running on a bit, but uh, I will speed up. Well, our model now is to actually take those published papers, those pixels on electronic paper, and act extract semantic information from it. Intelligent software reading scientific papers. Uh, now, I've built a lot of this. Um, it's been a sweat. Uh, it's extremely tedious, and it's not um, algorithmic. It's heuristic. But we've got a long way there. Uh, I'll show you in the next few slides. The problem we faced up to now is that if we do it, the publishers will sue me. They will close down the university subscriptions and sue me. Uh, and so we've had to fight that, and I spent half my time not writing software, uh, but actually fighting the publishers in Europe. The publishers have got lots of money. Uh, they've got five full-time lobbyists in Washington. They've probably got the same in... That's Elsevier, not just... Uh, 
add them all up, you get many more. We've seen these people. Ross, graduate student, uh, went off and took them on in Brussels and fought for no licenses. In other words, with the freedom to do what we want, we do not want your licenses, publishers, because the licenses control us. The licenses are there to stop us doing things, not to permit it. So last week we fought and we won the right in the UK. It is now legal uh, to use machines to read documents and to extract the facts from them. And we are going to start doing it. Uh, we've more or less built the software. We're going to show it tomorrow to people. We're going to get your input. You can help us build it. All sorts of things. There's a million papers a year. Uh, What's a million papers? 3,000 a, 3, a day, that's two every minute. I can mine the whole scientific literature on this laptop. It doesn't need a supercomputer. All it needs is the absence of lawyers. Uh, now, I'm very fortunate. I've been funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation uh, for a year, and uh, very probably for two, uh, to pull together this project. So Michelle is our project manager, among all the other things she does, right? And Ross is, uh, and Jenny are uh, with us as well. And we've got uh, two fantastic people, um, Cottage Labs and Richard uh, Smith, Anna, uh, to develop software. And Richard has been burning the midnight oil to get the software ready for tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so on. I'm just going to flick through very quickly now uh, to show what we can do. Here's some chemistry. Uh, and we can extract the science from it. So here is one paper on metabolism. That is a binomial name of a species. It's actually uh, the mold, the fungus that makes soy sauce. And these are the compounds that you get out of it. And the question about this is, are the compounds uh, toxic? It's relatively easy, as you can see, and we'll look at this tomorrow. How do you pull out the, um, uh, the binomial name? It's in italics, right? You spotted that, I'm sure. Uh, and they're all in text, so that makes it easy. Chemistry is a bit harder, but uh, in our group, Andy Howlett has written software which can completely understand that diagram from the pixels and turn it into uh, semantic chemistry. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but we have the idea of visitors. Uh, so if you've got an interest, if you're interested in clinical trials or uh, um, geolocations or anything, you build a visitor. Okay, you've got to write the code that does uh, the tricky thing, but it all fits in to the framework. Um, and that's just reiterating it. Uh, and that's reiterating the chemistry. And you can see here that we can get chemistry from both this uh, and this. And you can look them up. So we've got um, uh, public resources for looking things up. We're now a much better place for looking things up uh, than we used to be. Wikipedia is superb, and I've got the privilege of talking to Wikimania in August this year in London, and I shall tell them what a wonderful job uh, Wikipedia has done as a scientific reference. And if you think Wikipedia is wrong in places, you don't complain. You actually make it better. That's a simple model. Uh, and it will become the primary reference, the first point of call for people, unless they're really into a specialist area. Um, the other ones are things like PubChem or Kebi, which are financed by the NCBI and the European Bioinformatics <laughs> Institute. PubChem, when it came out, what did the American Chemical Society do? It sent lawyers to Capitol Hill uh, demanding it was shut down because it was socialized science. The NIH is a quasi-communist organization according to the American Chemical Society. I kid you not. That's the world we live in. Phylogenetic trees, we can hack this. We can actually pull the data out of this, uh, the letters, the words, the trees, and measure all the lengths of those, uh, and that takes about a second or two. Um, we get the species. It's in XML because I'm an XML freak, but it is very easy then to repurpose that. We can do the same with the chemistry, uh, and that's what the phylogenetic trees do. And I'm going to finish on this little example here. Here's a spectrum. Those of you who are chemists will know that this is a so-called proton spectrum and that 
uh, the hydrogens, which are not shown here, give rise to that, and the hydrogens here, which are not shown, gives rise to that. And you put it in the paper because you've proved what it's done. And that's fine. Referee looks at that and says, no problem, they've made what they thought. You give it to our software, Amy. Amy looks under the skin. Can you see in the middle a white square here? What's the white square there for? It's covering up a peak that the author didn't want to be seen. Uh, what's happened here is almost certainly that the um, student was in a rush, had to submit the paper, hadn't purified the compound. It probably is what they thought. This is probably solvent, but that's not good enough. It would have been rejected by the journal, so the author has covered it up. And that is increasing because of the pressure. Uh, and so our software can detect fraud of that sort. And that sort of thing is a very compelling argument to publishers. If you don't want us to find the fraud in your papers, then you are complicitly um, uh, producing bad science. Very strong argument. So open notebook science, this is what we should be doing. Matt Todd does it. Tim Gowers does it. It's not a theoretical possibility. It needs the will. We as a community have to decide how we get people from here to there. Because when we're there, science will happen twice as fast and be about five times better. So these are some of the people to thank. I won't go through all of them, uh, but um, I only uh, achieve anything because of the huge number of people um, uh, that I have the privilege to work with, and we all uh, work together. Uh, and at the end, I have put a few things that you, you yourself should do. Try and get this uh, into your discipline, release data into the public domain, and campaign against any reuse restrictions. So i just flip back to that so you can see it. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity and hopefully see some of you tomorrow. <laughs>